We're at Canola Palooza. This is Sean Haney with Real Agriculture. And right now we're joined by, honestly, somebody that got a lot of attention here today at this field day, Brian Tischler from Manville, Alberta. Brian, how's it going? Hey, really well, Sean. Okay, so, uh, you know, farmers have some time in their shop and people build a lot of really cool stuff. Some people may, you know, build uh, an extension to the cultivator or they'll maybe do uh, some sort of uh, adjustment to their planter. Very few people actually turn their tractor into an autonomous unit. What exactly have you done here? Well, I've written the software that uh, does mapping and section control and auto headland and a lot of the features that a lot of the high-end GPS units have. And at that point, I realized that the tractor is pretty much driving itself. And all it really needed was some remote control capability. So just to go that last little step wasn't that hard. It just in the last month, well, in fact, while the tractor was doing two or 3,000 acres of rolling this year is when I wrote the autonomous software on the computer that was driving the tractor. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I had time because I didn't have to turn. I didn't have to do anything. I, just, I was just in there because I had no way of stopping it. Yeah, what, one of the cool parts about all this is I, I think is because you, you've built the software and you've retrofitted it. Yes. It's not where you have to buy a whole brand new complete machine, you know, right off the assembly line in order to be able to access the latest in this kind of technology. What year is that tractor that is being powered here? Oh, it's like an 86 or something. It's a John Deere 4650. It's got, it's very peach. It's got like 6,000 hours on. It's my dad's favorite tractor and polish it every year and keep it in the shed. And it's a beautiful John Deere. Very cool. So I guess, you know, you've been interacting with growers here all day here at Canola Palooza. What have they been saying to you? Well, that is an interesting question because a lot of them don't know what to say. And I don't know what to say to them back. I asked, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to learn? And I, my favorite question has been, what is autonomous? And there'll be 30 people standing here going, I don't know. And there's the American Society of Automotive Engineers that can define the six levels of autonomy. But what does that mean to agriculture? What does that mean to people like you and me? And as we're looking uh, on upcoming autonomous vehicles and cars and trucks and, and now tractors and that sort of thing, what does it really mean? Does it mean just no driver? Does it mean that you can have a driver? There's so many different levels that is really, really hard to define. So you, you mentioned rolling. Rolling is one of the things we do on the farm that people mention often as something that could go autonomous because yes. it's just up and down the field. Harrowing. Harrowing, rolling. you know, uh, haying. Tillage. Exactly. There's other applications though where it's a bit of a tougher sell and people that are doubters to this kind of idea, they always jump to those first. It's like, yeah, but you know what I'm spraying, Ugh. you know, yes. but there is applications where it does have a fit. And do you see it that way too? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's nothing in farming has to be an all or nothing approach. There is every case needs to be taken on its, by its own example and evaluated whether or not it makes sense. Um, right now today, I don't think seeding makes sense because you have to refill the drill. There is so much going on and you can't, you can't really replace the expertise of that operator, certainly at this point. You can't put enough sensors in the thing to make it viable, at least I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that talk about autonomous, but they've never been in an autonomous tractor before. They haven't spent thousands of acres sitting in that seat watching that 0.1% of the time when it fails when it drives through a big hole where the gps blanks out where a headland is too steep where it rains now your lidar doesn't work where it rains and now your dirt's slippery and the speed that you've been going for 120 acres all of a sudden now you jackknife because you're on a side hill yeah but as a human operator we know to slow down when it's wet now we, we've been taping it and you can see it on the video here it's going relatively slow, but that doesn't, that, it's not limited by that. This is just for demonstration. You, you've had this tractor clipping a, around with no driver at 10 miles an hour. Absolutely. Well, we were rolling at eight mile an hour. Um, yeah, we just, last night, <laughs> they wanted me to, because it's a sprayer, they wanted me to do dust control on the road. So instead of setting up for the booth, I was doing dust control on the roads. <laughs> and I was just driving it with my cell phone up and down the road. Um, we didn't have much time last night, so just did everything very, very quickly. Um, it drives perfectly. It's an, it's an autonomous tractor. But when there's people here, uh, we don't want it to go kill dozer through the crowd. Mm -hmm. And safety is absolutely number one. Yeah. 80% so of my time on the autonomous has been about safety. Putting the LiDAR on the front of it, 
um, putting a emergency stop on it, putting uh, communication control so that if any module stops communicating with another module, it stops, it stops. Anything goes wrong, it stops. But it can still fail and keep going. Hmm. So where do we go from here? What, what's, what do you, what do you, like, where, do you, where do you take this? <laughs> really good question, Sean. <laughs> Originally, all I wanted to do was section control and mapping for our air seater, <laughs> and now we're to the point of doing everything that you know the big companies are afraid to do. And it's not that they're afraid; they're afraid of the liability. And I think that this is where people like me can kind of push the technology a bit. There is, it's like when phones first came out; people were afraid of them, you know. As technology moves forward, we need to get comfortable with it. And there's going to be bad experiences. Autonomous cars are a good example. A con autonomous car hits a, hits a pedestrian. Well, humans hit pedestrians too. Everybody understands the concept, or kind of, you see, you see the end of the road, but there's a lot of questions and things to be yes. worked on in, in the middle here. And, and that's where I think people that have that farming experience and obviously a keen interest and ability to do some of this programming and some of this work and the experimenting, it's a huge void that you're filling. Yeah, um, I think what makes this project unique and difficult is that there's nothing out there. All there is is master's engineering thesis, theses, uh, PhD theses, a lot of conceptual ideas on how to do a field. Uh, there, is, there are no examples. There is no information on how to do this stuff, so all of it has to come yeah. from inside, so to speak. Well, some of the greatest farmer inventions ever came from an idea sparked while someone was actually farming and said, I have to solve yes. a problem. And whether that's a cultivator shovel or some way to do some other activity we're doing all the time through the growing season, this is just another example of it. It's just a really super high-tech example. Brian, congratulations. Well, there, there's, there are two really good examples of, of two scenarios. One is technology looking for an application and an application looking for, for uh, technology. And it's the latter that works. What we're seeing a lot today is great technology, but it doesn't have an application. If we take something like an autom autonomous driving or trying to get most of the way there, we have an application and now we fit technology to that. And that's what's really key. And in terms of open source, we have a huge supply of knowledge from all over the world, people willing to share ideas, share knowledge. Um, that community, that open source community, is what's really missing in agriculture. And that, I think, is a really huge part of the future for agriculture, is open source. Brian, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, John.